Gainesville, Florida, Minister Audrey Williams. Come on, give her a hand. Come on, y'all can do better than that. our general overseer and our bishop of protocol and of course our Christian uh, education um, dean of Christian education Dr. Fairless amen and, and as Bishop uh, Toler think he said on our last phone call and all other tiers of CBF amen so we want to welcome you this morning so as we go and start talking about renew today here in our second day uh, I was given the assignment of when Bishop Toler told me the inspiration message I'm like, inspiration so if anybody knows me, y'all, I'm sorry, I gotta get my hair right, y'all, you know, women, we gotta be right, okay? Well, how's it look, girls? Am I good? Okay. Yeah. 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 So I'm one of those, I like def I like definitions, amen? All right, y'all know me. You know I gotta have it right, okay? So the definition of inspiration, y'all, is the process of feeling mentally stimulated to do or feel something, especially something innovative. Come on. A sudden, brilliant, creative, timely idea. The divine influence that led to the writing of the Bible, amen? amen. The drawing of a breath. Y'all ever thought about inspiration that way? Amen. Inhalation, y'all. That's inspiration, amen? So when we think about inspiring others, we often think about that grand gesture, don't we, right? It's gotta be something big, or just saying the right words, okay? Y'all, but you know, inspiration can come from a familiar smell, right, okay? Hearing an old school song, y'all know when y'all was driving up here, y'all had it on, right? Amen? Seeing a loved one accomplish a goal, touching a grain of sand at the beach, y'all, y'all ever been inspired? By something as simple as that. The things that God has given us. Amen? Amen. Tasting your mama's, well, I don't know about my mama's, <laughs> home-cooked cornbread. Y'all, but all these things can inspire us. So as, as we go through the Bible and we look at men and women throughout under extraordinary circumstances, y'all, right? They were able to inspire others to move, okay? To change, to hope. Because there was a whole bunch of crazy stuff going on in the Bible time, just like it's going on right now. Amen. Okay? Amen. But we always have to remember to inspire. Amen? So just as I look around the room, the collection of men and women, the states that are here, you all inspire me. That I'm to continue on. Because we know sometimes it gets hard. Yeah. And we just ain't got this thing right, y'all. But when we think about what has gone before us and what God has set before us, be inspired. Amen? All right, so your inspiration can come at the lowest point in your life. Y'all thought about that, right? When you down and God just gives you that little bit of something, that little nugget to just keep going, right? Right, at the lowest point, okay? And it also can come when you're running from the gifts that God has given you, right? Okay? No, am I the only one who ran? Okay. I just want to make sure. All right. I'm just checking the pulse of the room. Amen. All right. Okay. Amen. So in this room, y'all, there are books that need to be written to inspire somebody else. Okay. There are movies. Okay. Right. All right. There are songs that need to be written. There are video productions. There are building designs. Anybody in here an architect or like to doodle? Somebody has a creative an innovation, right? An inspiration, okay? All right, there are missionary trips, okay? Because we need to inspire the world for the kingdom of God. There are Facebook and YouTube sermons sitting in this room, y'all, okay? There are teachers in your community and in your church there are health fairs that need to be inspired. 
There's school outreach that needs to be inspired. There's the inspiration for us to be better pastors, better teachers, better husbands, better wives. Y'all, come on. Amen. Come on. Okay? Okay? So whatever that thing is, y'all, that God pointed you towards to fulfill on the behalf of the kingdom, that is your daily inspiration. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right, so now let's, what, what makes somebody, I was thinking about this too, so what makes someone inspirational? What you want to listen to somebody, right? Is it their compassion? Is it their passion? Is it their eloquent speech? Is it encouraging words? What is that thing? I say for me, it's the ability to be real in spite of the real life stuff, okay? Because somebody cried this morning before they came into this room, right? Somebody cried last night before they laid their head down in bed, right? Okay? But God inspired each and every one of us because our journey was different. Each and every one of us, but still inspired by God. Because I'll bet you if I asked probably 100% of the people in this room, there was a challenge to get here. Amen? Amen. But because it was God inspired, y'all uh -huh. sitting down in these chairs, drinking some water, eating some catfish in Mississippi. Amen. Come on, Amen. are the things that humble us. Mm -hmm. The adversity, those are the things that make someone inspirational. Mm -hmm. So your struggle is your story. Come on. Amen. 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 Right? Okay, y'all got it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Your struggle is your story. That's Amen. how we inspire. So let's go back to the folks of the Bible, okay? Moses was inspirational. He didn't mean to be, right? He was trying to run away, okay? He was, you know, okay. Esther was inspirational. Matthew, Dave, and even Job, right? Okay, even though we know that Job was play, it was still an inspirational story and all of the things that he went through. Amen? All right, okay. I'll turn the page. All right, so I do have five quotes that I wanted to, to share with you guys, and, and one of them that you'll, be, you'll probably know and will probably make you laugh, okay, but these were all said by, I say three of them were, were, I'll say people of the world, all right? And two of them, I, I, as far as I know, are believers, okay? And I'll just leave it at that, all right? So the first quote, and each one of these quotes before I go on, they each have an element to inspire to do something, okay? All right, so the first quote I have here is if we don't take control of our environment, it takes control of us. Wow. Okay? Wow. All right? So y'all stay away from gossip. Yeah. Drama. Uh-huh. Y'all know mm -hmm. the stuff that draws you away from God. Yeah. Okay? Let me read that again. If we don't take control of our environment, it controls us. Yeah. It's You're the right. same thing. Either you're serving God or you're serving the world. Right? Amen. Amen. I'm just saying. Do y'all want to know who said the quote? Yes. Yes? Yeah, yeah. It was actually it was Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins. Okay? All right, the second quote I have. On the other side of your maximum fear are all the best things in your life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to repeat that again. On the other side of your maximum fear are all the best things in your life. Wow. Yeah. Okay? All right, y'all, so when we trust God and we go, go, okay, the active word, right? We go boldly, just like this trip. Sometimes we don't have enough gas money to get us to where we're going, right? But he makes a way, okay? All right? So though, for those women who were single, same type of energy that goes into when you buy that wedding dress, when you haven't even met your husband, okay? All right, uh, did I hear okay back there from a man? Yeah. <laughs> uh, amen. <laughs> All right, but you understand inspiration, okay? On the other side of our maximum fear. Because some, what, what do they say? It? Do it scared. Mm -hmm. Do it scared. Mm -hmm. And everybody in this, well, everybody I know that's grown and is a real believer 
has done is scary. Mm -hmm. Amen. But we trusted that God was our foundation. Mm -hmm. He was what we walked over on. Right? Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. It was the faith that pulled us through. Amen. So you guys want to know who said that quote? Yes, ma'am. All right. And he has had some recent, uh, what is the, some recent uh, issues. Oh, God. <laughs> His initials are WS. Will Smith. Will Smith. Amen. All right. This one will probably make you all laugh. Number three. Do or do not. There is no try. None of you truckies don't know this one? What? Do or do not. Do or do not. There is no try. Y'all don't know this quote? No. No. It wasn't Kurt. No. <laughs> okay, well, well, it was Yoda. Oh. So the Empire Strikes Back. I can't believe I just thought you guys would have known the quote. That's why I don't know you know. That is why. I mean, I would think of all the quotes. Anyway, it doesn't matter that Yoda said it. Was it important? That's right. Empire Strikes Back, y'all. Y'all got to be out there in the swamp. Okay, Yoda out there talking. Do or do. Anyway. But. However, it is inspirational, okay? Right. So when you step into your ministry, okay, with your whole heart, I think it was Bishop Deans was talking yesterday, you can't go half-hearted on anything with God, mm -hmm. right? Because you're not going to get what you're going to get if you don't go Come on. all the way, okay? Because God will lead you one step at a time. I know I want to know the first five, ten steps, but he only going to give me one, right? right. Okay, right. all right? So now, the greater risk in doing, well, let me put it this way. There's actually greater risk in doing nothing. And y'all always be mindful that with your gifts that God gave you, if you don't use them, you can lose them. Oh, yes. but it's just like your, your, your muscle mass, yes. right? right? Which you ain't been to that gym in 10 years, right? Why you flabby, okay? Right? Use it or you lose it, okay? So... Guard and protect your gifts mm -hmm. by heeding God's call. Just like yesterday, I believe it was also mentioned, your anointing, his appointing. Amen? Wow. So let me repeat that quote again. Do or do not, there is no try. Mm. Okay? All right, so you can't try to crank up the car. I'm just going to use that as an example. Either you crank it up or you don't. And if it did crank up, then you have to call AAA. But y'all understand what I'm saying. That's right. Do or do not, there is no try. Basically, don't go half-hearted. Mm. Be, be the real deal. Otherwise, just leave it leave it there. Leave it in the store. Mm. Amen. So I want to inspire you to do that. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, fourth quote that I have is put God first in everything you do. That's a real simple quote. Real simple quote. And I'll tell you actually who said that. Denzel Washington said that at a commencement speech to um, a college. It was probably, it was, I think it was like late 90s. It was quite some time ago. And he said, if I might have been, actually. And he said, stick with him. Stick with God, y'all. He said, fail big, but take chances. He said, step outside of the box. Have goals, but also have discipline and consistency so when you're doing work for god all right okay or even when you're preparing to do work for god you gotta be prayed up you gotta be in your bible right get around good god loving god fearing leadership okay so you can get some good um advice mm -hmm. okay so again stick with god fail big but take chances outside of the box. I believe that's a faith thing. Have goals and you want to have discipline and consistency. As with anything, right? Y'all were talking yesterday about changing your eating habits. Well, you can't do it one day and expect to lose 20 pounds. Okay? Well, you can, but you basically, right. If I did one crunch and it was bam, amen. I would love, I'd spend a little money on that. But you have to do it consistently because you can't just pray one time and be where you need to be in That's your right. spiritual life. Amen? Right. Amen. Amen. Amen? Okay. 
All right, so the fifth quote that I have is, I'll tell you who did this one, and it, it's a, I kind of paraphrase this, y'all, so y'all, well, anyway. All right, always feel that you count, have worth, and ultimate significance. Be determined to achieve excellence. Set out to do it and do it well. Be the best at beauty, love, and justice, and by all means, keep moving. Amen? Any ideas who said this? I'll tell you real quick. Martin Luther King Jr. Right. Always feel that you count, have worth, and ultimate significance. Be determined to achieve excellence, set out to do it, and do it well. Be the best at beauty, love, and justice, and by all means, keep moving. Amen? So think about this is a, that was words that he spoke back in the 60s and all of the unrest, the racial unrest that was happening at that time. We know that Dr. King was eloquent mm -hmm. in, in his words, right? Mm -hmm. And his passion and everything like that. But those words are still very relevant today Amen. that we have to be mindful because if we don't, we get wrapped up mm -hmm. in not yeah. being beautiful mm -hmm. and not showing love mm -hmm. and not showing mm -hmm. justice. Okay, so the inspiration comes from, he says, be determined to achieve excellence. That's something that God has called us to do anyway. We shouldn't be doing the same thing that the world is doing. That's right, right? We should That's be doing right. what the word says because Amen. the word tells us who we're supposed to be. Um, we're not supposed to be like Beyonce and Jay-Z, mm -hmm. okay, or the Kardashians, on, or anybody else. Right. I mean, even, even these folks that are supposed to be believers, when you see the foolishness that they're bringing, y'all should know because the word already told you you're not supposed to be acting a fool. I'm just saying, okay? I'm not trying to be on a soapbox, but y'all ought to know. Or the church, I'll put it this way, should know, because I know nobody in this room is doing that. Right. Amen? <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Amen? All right, so so as, as y'all head home over the next couple of days, you know, I want you to be inspired to show the world God's love. Mm -hmm. Well, the love of God, because that's what we're called to do anyway. This is no scientific, super duper formula. That's what the word says, right? And we're supposed to spread the gospel and spread the love of Christ. Nothing, nothing magical, amen? So stay true to what he has called each and every one of you to be, okay? I can't be you and you can't be me, right? So if he gave you the gift to braid, you be the best braider there is. Come on, yeah. If he gave you the gift to teach, you be the best teacher that you can be, right? If you're the best mama or the best doodler, okay, be true to that. Don't try to be somebody else as they say, run your race. Because when you start getting in somebody else's lane, now you jacking up your stuff and you jacking up somebody else's stuff, okay? So it's all right to be who God made you. That's okay, your hair, all right? You can go to the store and change your hair, right? But be okay with the hair that God gave you. But you can always improve on that. But it's still your hair. Okay, because once you go to the store, ladies, y'all know what y'all buy. It's your hair. It's your hair. It's your hair now. It's your hair, right? Okay. You used to belong to the store, now it's your hair. Amen? Okay. All right, but thank God in advance for what, he, what is already yours. Okay? He's already given you the gift of giving. He's already given you the gift of being creative. He's already given you the gift to be joyful, to be peaceful, to be grateful. He's already given you his mercy. So receive that and pass on mercy to other folks. He's already given you wisdom. Now some folks, y'all need some more wisdom, okay? That's, that's, that's globally, that's not just in this room, okay? But he's giving you some wisdom, he gave you a book 66 books, right? Come on, man. With what? 250,000 words of guidance, mm -hmm. okay, for wisdom. So you got to dig in that too, just like everything else, Amen. okay?
But each one, be inspired here to teach one. I want you to aspire to make a difference. Whatever that thing is, that when you get home, because help others, inspire others through the vehicle of God's love. Amen? Amen. All, right. Amen. All right. I do have, I did want to, uh, I wanted to read a scripture real quick like. Also, I did want to, before I read the scripture, I did want to say that I believe the world has lost sight of who God is. Amen. Okay. Yeah. And the church has too, y'all. Yeah. Okay? Right. But y'all be reminded that he is He is creator. That's the first thing we typically go to, right? That he is master. He is healer. He is father. He is faithful. Okay? He is truthful. He is gracious. He is all-knowing. He is trustworthy. Miracle worker. Yeah. Savior. Holy Spirit. Jaira, our provider. Amen? Amen. All right, so we need to put that on the shirt. Okay. All right, so I'm going to close this with, <laughs> with uh, Romans 8. I'm going to read from the message, uh, verses 31 through 39. And again, just talking about what God has, has given us and that we need to flow in that inspiration. And I do have a statistic, because my, all my Florida folks know I'm a numbers girl, that there's some statistics that scientists were talking about that it says that we spend 20% of the time doing the things that we're actually passionate about. So that means we spend the other 80% of our lives or our day or our month, right, doing busy stuff. So if we flip that around and we did 80% of what God called us to be, what is what our heart tells us, what God has told us. Think about the world that we would live in. We wouldn't see, hopefully, so much foolishness. I mean, we know the foolishness is coming because that's what the word says, amen? But within our own individual lives and our own communities, we can have an impact that way. So I'll say that to just to encourage you all to value the time that God has given each and every one of us because we know tomorrow is not promised to us, amen? amen. amen. And don't miss your inspiration. Don't miss it. Find it. If you, because you know sometimes we just get lost in the stuff. Yeah. And we are not, we can't inspire somebody else because we can't inspire ourselves. Right? But dig in, y'all, because I know sometimes it's just tough. Dig in, find it, or renew it. Uncover it. Sometimes it's just buried under a little bit of dust. Amen? Amen. All right? So let's remember to be effective rather than busy. Remember that? Let's be effective rather than busy. So as we think about renewal today, keep that in mind. Amen? All right, so like I said, I'm going to close here with Romans 8, 31 through 39 out of the message. Amen. All right, here we go. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, if there is anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us, and who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Huh. Who would dare even to point a finger, the one who died for us, who was raised to life for us is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Mm. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today 
or tomorrow? High or low? Thinkable or unthinkable? Absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Amen. So I want to close with that, y'all. Be inspired. Yes, Romans 8, yes, 31 through 39. Amen? Amen. Open our hearts to be renewed, but get out there and inspire. Amen? Amen. Thank you for your time this morning, everybody. Y'all give our director another hand. Thank you. What a way to start the day, huh? Yes. Amen. Y'all sleep well last night? Yes. Y'all eat well last night? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us went out and don't know how to act. <laughs> Folk right here, like where they come from. <laughs> Amen. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you my friend, my best friend, um, awesome man. And so before I bring him up, let me tell you, look at him. There he is, ready to go, got his go-to going on <laughs> and all of that. But um, there's some things going on that you all don't know. You ain't gonna find out today, but nope. just hang on. <laughs> Amen. Just hang on. Nope. So, so it, it, you all are in the right place. Amen. Now, you, you hear what I'm saying? Um, you're in the right place. All of us can do church, uh -huh. but you're to get more. Y'all understand? Yeah. The better we do the other stuff, the stuff that um, Director Audrey was talking about. We don't understand that makes us do better, church. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Go to Sunday school and watch what happened to your worship. Yeah. I mean, go consistently. Yeah. That's it. Wow. Come to church with God, not with that stuff you've been carrying. Yeah. Even yeah. during the week when we carry it, we shouldn't be carrying it. But come focused mm -hmm. and watch what happens to your worship. Did y'all hear me? Come with a servant's mentality and watch what happens to your service. Are y'all hearing me? Yes, sir. Today is Christian Education Day. Yes, sir. What you're going to get is going to enhance your worship. It's going to enhance your service. Are y'all with me? Yes, sir. So, you know, keep all of this in mind. Amen. You all are in the right places. I'm looking around this room, some old, some new. Um, I've made wonderful friends. Two sitting back here at this table met last night and hung out for the first time, and I heard them on the way to the elevator. Man, we gotta stay in touch. And I believe they are gonna do that. You know what I'm saying? So, new friends, amen. amen. So, but overall, we are all gonna get what we need. And so, um, more's coming. Can't talk about it because it ain't finished yet. Still cooking. But um, trust me, y'all. Trust me. Hang with us. Amen? If you're thinking about it, if this don't do it, this is not what you're looking for. Amen? Amen. All right. So my best friend, my buddy, my pal, Dr. John Fairless, um, just let me tell you, he is our dean of Christian education. <laughs> Man. I've seen fellowships, reformations, organizations, denominations. I've seen it all. But nobody has better Christian education than Christian Baptist Fellowship International. Tell you that. I'm telling you, I have not seen it. Some of y'all affiliated with other folks. I am too. Nobody has what we have as far as Christian education. If you don't get it, you don't want it. Are y'all with me? So let me tell you why we are the best Christian education. Bar none. Dr. Fairless's undergraduate studies came from the University of Tennessee Martin. 
Now, I had on my gator shirt yesterday, my gator orange and the blue. So for me to say that, it's got to be good, right? <laughs> Some of y'all LSU folk in here. Some of y'all Mississippi State Ole Miss folk in here. Where your school at? You come from up north even though you're in Texas. You in North Carolina. That baby blue, which one you like? Or the Duke one? Oh, okay, all right. But y'all got the picture. So he comes from the university. He's from Tennessee. And his undergraduate studies from University of Tennessee Martin. His graduate studies came from Vanderbilt University. And y'all know about Vanderbilt. You can beat them in sports, but you ain't beating them in education. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and also, he went on to, uh, to get his doctorate from Princeton Theological Seminary. Is it the Theological Seminary, Dr. Fairless? Yes, sir. All right. So I told y'all that to let y'all know we are qualified, bona fide, and, and everything. So when I say our Christian education department is the best bar none, he's got the credentials to back up what he says. That's right. Amen. 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 Are y'all in the house? Amen. Are y'all inspired now? Amen. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to ease out of the way and soak up what he has to say um, because he's got something for y'all. So pay attention. Amen. Amen. Here's what's upcoming. So, without further ado, my best friend, my buddy, my pal, and my dean, Dr. John Fairless. Amen. Amen. Bishop Dixon, thank you. You know how much I love you. Oh, uh, Bishop Toler, are, are we coming through? Y'all, am, am I all right, Lorenzo? Good, good. Um, Bishop Toller, God bless you for your leadership and this fellowship. And I am, uh, like many others, been praying with you. I'm happy you're doing better. We still hear a little bit of that in your throat, but God is delivering you, bringing you through COVID, like others I know in our fellowship. Bishop Dixon, Bishop Deans, as always, you brought, you brought the whole load for us yesterday. And I love both these gentlemen. I love serving on the Bishop's Council with all of them. God bless you and thank you so much. Let me say that Overseer-Elect Dr. Sims, did you bring a word yesterday? <laughs> Goodness. And it's such a great setup for what I want to talk about today, but all the ways we can get distracted, all the things the devil throws at us, all the ways we can, uh, you know, it was just powerful. God bless you, uh, Dr. Sims. That was great. And Minister Audrey, I want you to know I love you this morning. I am inspired. Yeah. I could smell your mama's home-cooked cornbread. <laughs> oh, I know that our struggle is our story. <laughs> Thank you. And I want you to know I got Yoda. I, I was trying to holler over the screen. You know, dude. <laughs> there is try. No, no, no. There is no try. Do you do it? So God bless you for bringing that word to set us up right today. I've been given the topic on this second day as we continue to think about life unlocking, and today we turn toward restore and restoring. And I want to speak for a few minutes and share for a few minutes on the topic of restoring your mind and your spirit. I want you to think back to Dr. Sims talking yesterday of how our minds get, oh, we got so much coming at us. And when our, when our minds are blocked up, when our minds are rattled and confused, it affects our spirit, it affects our bodies. We, we are whole human beings. That's the way God created us. And we are in need of some restoration. I'm going to say in just a minute, we, we know that we've got a problem. We know that we've been facing difficulties. Life is hard enough. Throw some COVID on top of that. Throw coming out, trying to come out of that. Throw the, the, the disharmony that Satan tries to sow in our midst, in our churches, and in our ministries. Whew, we know we need some restoration. And that's why you've come to this conference I intended to be there live. I, I, I'm so grateful for this video technology today. Um, it's been quite a healthcare year for me, and I want to thank you for the prayers of so many in CBF during a time of uh, recovery that I had uh, following cancer. 
and of the uh, time of um, surgery I've just been going through. Uh, I had to have surgery on my heel and it's recovering a little bit slowly. And uh, so my doctor has not released me for travel yet, but here we are, here we are. Now, let's move on to the business of the day. And God bless you for the fellowship you've been having and that you're gonna have. I wanna come this morning from that fact that yes, we do have a problem. And we've got a little bit of a problem. I wanna come from Proverbs 23, seven today. You may wanna to turn to that in your Bible. And when you do, I'm gonna tell you that uh, depending on the translation you have, you may or may not come directly from the verse I'm going to use, I am going to be using the new King James Version. If you have the good old trusty King James Version, it'll read like this. It may read a little different if you are in the New Living or the New International or the New Revised Standard or the New American Standard or certainly in the Message, which is a, a, a great translation. But don't, don't lose me now. I, I want you to stay with me. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, that's not just men, of course. <laughs> this is all of us. Men and women. This, the, the, this word in the, in the Hebrew is for all of us. For all of us. We, we are human. As a man, as a woman thinks in, in his or her heart, that's the way they are. That's just the way uh, we are. The New Living and the, the New International Version say, we are always thinking. You got to you got to realize we are always thinking and the way we're always thinking is the way our life comes out. New American, which is maybe the most accurate translation from the from the biblical language, in this case, Hebrew, uh, says as he thinks within himself, we think inside of ourselves. So he is. That's the way we are. Now, <laughs> this is old language, and the new re revised standard version, which I use a lot of the time, says that someone who is always plotting within themselves is like a hair in the throat. Wow. wow. Like, like a hair in the throat. <laughs> right? So that, that's an interesting translation. <laughs> Stay with me, though. Kemo sha'ar ben in who the Hebrew says exactly the way you calculate the way you reckon the way you um, you think uh, the old Hebrew word means to split something open the way you crack it open and take a look at it and think about it within your soul it's more than just your brain it's more than just your thoughts the way you think about it within your soul then that's the way you are. This, this verse tells us, this verse lifts up the three main expressions of who we are. This is just, this is how we present ourselves to the world. This is how we are in our families. This is how we are at church. This is how we are at work, at school, wherever we are. We think, so it, it talks about the thinking part of ourselves. We feel, when you're talking about the heart, you're talking about the way you feel, the wide range of emotions that you experience. And this verse talks about what we do, our doing, our actions, our acting, the way we act. And I want you to stop and think about it. We've all got enough experience, and most of us have enough education. We, we've learned basic science, and many of you have, have learned basic uh, psychology or sociology. You know that as human beings, it, we think, we feel, 
and that dictates how we act, wow. right? So this is a very important cycle that this ancient wisdom from the scripture lifts up for us. And I want to dig into that today, and I want to talk about the ways that we think. I want to talk about the ways that we feel and how that results in the ways that we act and in what we do. And I want to examine the places where we are in, we are in need of some restoration. And uh, I would ask you, don't, I don't need an out loud answer right now, but if you really want to affect, if you really want to restore or renew a person's actions, where do you need to start? Do you start by telling them, now don't do that, do something different. I think what we're going to see today is we need to move down into the level of not only the heart, but back into the mind and say, we need to think differently wow. so that we can feel differently, and then we can act differently. Mm -hmm. So, in our world today, and again, I, I want to thank Dr. Sims uh, yesterday, and, and Minister Audrey today talked about this. We, we're in need of some new inspiration, but in our world today, on these three levels, our thinkers are pretty mixed up. There's some crazy thinking going on, and, and we've all... We've, we've all suffered from that, right? COVID, they talk about COVID brain. It's a new thing that, that have the COVID fog. And, and, and not only COVID, just the way we live our lives today, our thinkers get really mixed up. And things can spin us all the way around. And that means oftentimes that our feelers are a mess. We're not sure how to feel. We're not sure where our uh, emotions are attached. And, uh, you know, love and hate and uh, jealousy and greed and all of these emotions are, are conflicting and they're competing in our lives today. Our feelers can really be messed up. And especially for the church, because I'm talking to the church today, our actions are increasingly carnal. Somebody know what carnal means? It's of the flesh. The carne means meat or flesh. Carnal, not spiritual. So Paul talked to the church and he said, I would that you were spiritual. I would that you were mature. I, I want to be talking to those who are mature, but you are carnal. Yeah, and you are not ready for meat. I'm still feeding you with milk. Come on, God. Our actions, as a result of our emotions and as a result of the way we're thinking, are increasingly carnal. Now, pastors, I'm not asking anybody to hold up your hand or even say amen, but you're seeing this in your church? Are you seeing this in your community? Mm. We are a confused people who seem to have lost our way. Wow. Yeah. There's more confusion than I can remember seeing in, in my life in a long time. And I'm, I'm the senior eldest, let me put it this way, the eldest member of the Bishop's Council and one of the elders uh, uh, within CBF. We've lost some great elders, I know, in the last year or two with COVID and other things. But I'm going to tell you, in more than 40 years of ministry, people are more confused than I've ever seen. People have lost their way. People are aimless. Our churches feel aimless, feel directionless. Scripture says where there is no vision, the people perish. And I find churches and pastors and ministers themselves struggling with which is the way to go. I love that little girl. That's why I put her picture. She's just, she's like she's up on her head saying, oh my goodness, what are all these folks in my church doing and saying? <laughs> and that, that maze in that bottom picture, which, which way are we supposed to go? How are we ever going to get out of here? <laughs> I'll just let that sit there for a minute. <laughs> In our computer age, 
we understand the ancient wisdom of Proverbs. Wow. Because the computer age knows that if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Wow. Right? Yeah. Computers, as smart as they are, and they're everywhere, right? You know, you've got a computer running your cell phone, running your laptop, running your tablet, running, you know, you go to the bank and use the ATM as a computer, and, and, and everything's on the computer. But it can't do anything you don't tell it to. And if you tell it the wrong thing, guess what it will do? The wrong thing. Every time. And this is true. I believe this is what Proverbs is trying to tell us. When you put garbage in to your mind, into your thoughts, it's going to trail down and trail garbage into your heart and into your feelings and emotions. And that's going to come as garbage out of your mouth, in your actions, in your choices, in your relationships. So even old Sparky there knows <laughs> garbage in, garbage out, okay? My question today is, because it's easy to pick on the church and it's easy to pick out and, and say, and I'm hearing a lot of people say, well, it's just all gone crazy. It's just all gone bad. And we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. Well, why come to a conference if, if, if all the dean of Christian education going to do is tell you how bad it is and not give you any way out? Yeah. Right? So... I want to be driven the rest of our time today by the question, how do we reverse this flow? Instead of garbage in, garbage out, how do we get good stuff in? That good stuff will come out of this cycle that the scripture has been teaching us for a long, long time. So I want to come back to an ancient secret for today. Oh, it's, it's a strong recipe. It's a powerful process. It's an ancient secret that's been out in plain sight the whole time. But we've probably lost it. Scripture gives us an antidote to the constant overstimulation of our world and our society. And that's where a lot of this confusion comes from. And I'm going to warn you, I'm going to be stepping on some toes this morning, and I'm going to be walking down the aisle, and I might even do a little happy dancing like Bishop Dean's, I don't know. Uh, I'm coming after you because we are all subject to the constant overstimulation of our world. Wow. From the television, from the radio, from the iPod, from our cell phones, from uh, commercials to news to everything else, we are so overstimulated. There's something always coming in. Or sensory perception, and that means our eyes and our ears are, are the gateway into our minds, right? And we've already seen that the way it is in your mind is what's going to be in your heart, and that's the way you're going to act. Man, we got so much stuff coming in. I want us to look to the wisdom of Scripture to find this ancient secret. And the secret is meditation. Wow. Yeah. Quietness with purpose. Uh. Now, meditation sometimes gets a bad name in our world, and I, I grew up, and, and, and I had a church, and I had a pastor, uh, you know, and I, it was a while ago when I was growing up, so it goes back to the 70s and the 80s, and there was this thing called transcendental meditation that comes from Eastern religion, and we were warned, oh, don't get into that stuff, don't let them take you on these meditative journeys, don't do all of that, they, and, there's a lot of other kinds of meditation, but remember, I'm going to take you to the wisdom of Scripture today, and I want to claim the rightful place of meditation 
as a spiritual and for us especially a Christian discipline. Mm -hmm. So follow me in the word. Genesis 24, 63, the first place that mentioned this says, Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide. Mm -hmm. Now, you know the story of Isaac, Abraham's son, he's growing up, he doesn't have a wife, they're all getting kind of worried at how God is going to continue the promise, and and uh, uh, they send the servant off to go find Isaac a wife, but he's a little nervous about all of that. Is, is anybody going to come? Am I going to find a wife? What? How's she going to be? What's she going to look like? She's going to be pretty? She's going to be ugly? I don't know. And <laughs> It, it, instead of letting all those things just go over and over and over around his brain, instead of letting his thinking remain crowded, what did Isaac do? Oh, man. Mm -hmm. He went out mm -hmm. uh -huh. to meditate mm -hmm. yeah. in the field at eventide, took a walk, went outside. Not long after this verse is when Rebecca shows up. She sees Isaac walking in the field and it's, I love that story. It's not the point today, but she jumped down <laughs> off the couch and ran. Cause evidently she'd been meditating too. Ooh, I wonder what he's gonna look like. And, and she saw him, she said, oh, he looks pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Joshua. Joshua chapter one, you know, Joshua was taken over from Moses and he's pretty nervous because Moses for 40 years led the people. And now Moses is gone and Joshua's got to step up and, you know, he's overstimulated. Now he's got to keep up with all these people. They're looking to him for the lead. They, they you know, they don't know what they haven't crossed over into the promised land yet. And they've got to take care of all of that work. So all the people are nervous and Joshua is nervous. And God speaks a word and says, this book of the law, my guidance that I've given to you shall not depart from you, but you shall what? Meditate, Meditate on it day and night. Meditate on it. The opening of the Psalter which is a name for the whole book of Psalms, right? The 150 Psalms, they, they, they give us such wonderful depth of insight and experience. And the Psalms is the best place to go to put good, uh, good food into your mind and let it feed your heart and your soul and your spirit. And Psalm chapter one or Psalm one is an introduction to the whole book. And, and the second verse says, for the man of God, for the woman of God, their delight is in the law of the Lord and on God's law doth he meditate day and night. And to come into our Christian scripture, one of my favorite verses in Philippians chapter four, verse eight, whatsoever things are true, whatever is noble, whatever is just and pure and lovely and of good report, what are we to do? Meditate or think on these things. You want a list of, of the good stuff to put in? Go to Philippians. Is it true? Is it noble? Is it just? Is it pure? Oh, wonderful stuff. And finally, I know this is prayed in your worship, several several of us, maybe all of us, and I, I pray this often at uh, the start of our worship service from Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the what of my heart? Patience of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength redeem. Mm. Now, you want to be scriptural? You need to have some time in your life to meditate. Yes, yes sir. And, and, and you, you need to be able to take these truths in, and you need to be able to have time to let God speak not only to your mind, but into your heart and into your spirit. I, I told you that 
that um, uh, Proverbs 23, when you translate the Hebrew, it's not just talking about your mind and heart. It's talking about your soul and your spirit. The Hebrews believe we were all one in creation. You can't really separate what you think and what you feel from, from, from your spirit, from your soul. So I want us to get started today. Now, let me tell you that I'm working on an, an entire new workshop, an entire new series just on this meditation. Okay, probably going to be a book, Minister Audrey. You said somebody here today needs to write a book. <laughs> yeah. But I, I want to at least get us started today, and I want to give you some, some exercise and some discipline that you can take home with you. And so to get started, I'm going to ask you to trust me. Uh, right now, I want you to put down your pen or page or paper. I want you to put down your iPhone, your computer, uh, your tablet, whatever you've got. You need to be undistracted for a moment. And I just want to ask you to close your eyes. You may want to shift around in your chair a little bit, kind of. I know you've been sitting for a while. Maybe shake loose just a little bit and uh, get as comfortable as you can in your chair. And I just want you to close your eyes and just listen to the sound of my voice for a moment. You're going to get all of these instructions written down. But right now, just listen. Just listen. With your eyes closed, I want you to begin to breathe in and out through your nose. Just natural rhythm. In and out. Two or three times, just begin to pay attention to your breath. And while you continue to breathe, I want you to let your eyes be relaxed. You may even need to reach up and just rub them for a second. Let your eyes relax. I want you to slide down a little bit and let the tension go out of your jaws. In fact, just let your jaw be slightly open. Huh. Let your jaw open a little bit. That keeps you from clenching your teeth. Let your jaw be open. Now everybody drop your shoulders down. Let your shoulders drop and relax. And again, I want you to just breathe in and out. Breathing in and out. Now take a little bit deeper breath in. Hold it for just a moment. And breathe it out. And one more time. A deeper breath in. Hold it. And now breathe it out. And gently open your eyes. How do you feel right now? Wow. Think about how you, think about how you felt three minutes ago. Now, now we didn't really do we didn't really do anything but stop which is the key we're going to discover stop close our eyes and try to let our body relax and just breathe and I, I gave you a couple of prompts to help you you know relax because where does the tension come as we get worked up during the day right Man, we start squinting, I get all tight, we're looking at somebody, our jaws get clenched, anybody have a problem with gritting your teeth? I got to go to the dentist next, next month, and she said, oh, mercy, we got to do something with your teeth, you've been grinding them down. 
and our shoulders, man, at work. And even when you're in, in, in church listening to your pastor, if you're not careful, you get all worked up and your shoulders go up. So all I did was ask you to breathe and gave you a couple of ideas of where you could relax. And you just sat in the quiet for about a minute. Feel different? That's just a small example of how we get ready to enter into a time of meditation, into a time of quiet. Isaac went out for a walk in the field at night. Now, he probably kept his eyes open, and you you can, all right? You can. It's just easier when we're in a room like this to, to close our eyes and get all the distractions away. But Isaac went out, and he started walking. You can imagine he had that nice, steady walking pace. He probably automatically began to let his breathing match the pace of his walk. And maybe as he scanned the horizon, he watched the sun beginning to set and it was just a a peaceful moment. You can almost just feel his breath calming him, right? We almost have to learn again how to do these things. Mm -hmm. Because again, our pace is so... Uh, uh, is so dramatic, it's so uh, all the time going that we rarely anymore have a quiet moment in our lives and we rarely um, take time just to stop and breathe. There's a reason we tell somebody that's very upset and we're talking to them and if we if we don't know what else to say, we say, okay, okay, oh, just breathe, okay? Just take a breath. And and even one breath, but certainly a couple more breaths like we did. I just encourage you. Your breath does something powerful, if you will let it. When did Adam, the first man, God's creation, when did his real, true life Began. When did he become, there in Genesis chapter 2, uh, a living soul? You remember that? And the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living soul. The very first gift God gave to us. Our breath. And yet we have learned to breathe incorrectly most of the time. Now, I'll have this in the in the uh, workshop. I'll have these things in the book. I could tell you at least 15 or 20 different ways you have learned to breathe wrong. We get all hunched over. We get all hunched up. We get all tight. We start grasping for breath in our mouth. Did God make your mouth to breathe with? God made your nose to breathe with. Notice I asked you to breathe in and out through your nose. (laughs) I find that I have to have people do that because we've learned many wrong ways to breathe. But the breath is the place to start. I hope you will have this little exercise. If you've jotted it down, I'm going to make this slide deck available. Uh, But you can remember this. Just stop and, and close your eyes and just take two or three breaths. Calmly, deeply, use those relaxing points, and then come back to what you're doing. It's it's a great place to begin this practice. Now, I want to tell you why this breath works, and I want to use a little quick dash of science here and help us all understand our brains are wired are created and uh, over the long history of humanity you know there was a time that humans lived out in nature all the time right and they had to hunt for a living and 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 to to make their uh uh, to you know, to be able to get their food, had to go out in the field and work and make it. And in, out in the natural world, we needed brains that were wired to help protect us, brains that could detect a threat. And I, the base of our human brain is really good at that. We're wired to always 
be looking and listening, watching, um, and, and watching out for threats. And so we are wired for the fight or flight response. Y'all heard of that? Yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, what, what am I going to need to do? Something happens. Boom. There's a saber-toothed tiger. Boom. And your brain says, what are you going to do? I know what mine's going to say. I, I'm not in the first character. I'm in the second one. Flight. I'm going to get out of here. You know, I had a fly. Sometimes we get a threat. Somebody comes at us, you know, and men, we're real prone on this. Somebody wants to come at you. And what does your brain tell you first thing? Mm-hmm. Ease up. You stand up. Uh-uh. This is my territory. You are automatically wired for fight or flight. It happens that fast. The one down there on the end, sometimes you're not sure if you need to fight or flight. And what you do is you freeze. Freeze. I don't know what to do. Now, I'm going to show you in a minute. When our brains get a chance, when we slow down, when we can stop and we can think about it, our human brain is especially good at taking a longer thought process, taking time to analyze it and think about it. And we are also wired for the stage known as rest and digest. Mm -hmm. Just think about those ancient hunters. They're out and they're, they're evaluating all the threats. And then finally, the, the hunt is successful and they get a buffalo or they get a tiger or uh, if they're fishing, they get a, a good haul of fish and they, and they bring them home to everybody. And there is a great feast and, and everybody's feeling good. What is and, and all the threats are, 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 you know, put away. What is the time to do? Oh, we're going to rest and we're going to digest. Our brains rarely rest in the world we're in, and therefore we rarely digest the brain food that we need. Even in our modern time, when it's time to eat, what kind of food do we get the majority of the time if we're not careful? Fast food. Fast food, because we don't have much time. I don't know where y'all are gonna go eat lunch today, but you know, <laughs> but most of the time we have lost the, the 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 ability to do like my family used to do. You come in, you sit down to table, you serve your plate, you take your time, uh, you talk to one another, rest and digest. We don't get much time to rest anymore. I got a quick lunch break. I got to grab something on the go, and. That goes for the, the things we take in, too, and it goes for our spiritual food. We rarely rest in the truths that are being taught to us or that we are discovering and give them time to, to, to digest. This is what it looks like in your brain. And what we suffer from, scientists have a name for it. They call it the amygdala hijack. Now. If you can see this uh, this chart, you see right in the center of this picture of the human brain, and I don't think it's coming through on my screen. I've got a pointer, but I don't, I'm not sure it's coming through. Right in the center of that, uh, uh, well, I tell you what, let me start with the eyeball. Let's start with the eyeball. This eyeball on the lower sort of right-hand side represents uh, our sensory receptors, right? This is what we see. We could have put a pair of ears up here because what we hear it can be what you taste, you know, what you feel. So that eyeball represents all of our senses. And so when we see something or hear something, it comes in and it enters into our brains and it goes very first to that yellow part in the center that is called the thalamus of the brain. It is the thought processing center. It's the gatekeeper of your brain. When you see my PowerPoint today, it's going first to your thalamus. When you hear my voice coming out over the speaker, it's going through your ears and going first to the thalamus. Okay? Now, the thalamus says, where do I need to send this? And when we are in a restful state, when we are in a calmer state, when we are not overstimulated, the thalamus 
takes that first big arrow to the back and it sends it back to that purple part of the brain called the occipital lobe. Uh -huh. Your occipital lobe is bigger and it's got more brain power and it starts to think about this and it starts to organize this and it says, oh, hmm, you love french fries, so in a minute you're going to you're going to turn them french fries up and and maybe you're going to put a little ketchup on them or scatter a little pepper and you're going to eat them and oh man it's going to taste good that's what your occipital lobe begins to tell you it may tell you mm -mm, brussels sprouts ain't something you've ever learned to like son and you don't want none of that okay it's beginning to think or it's beginning to organize your thoughts and then the occipital lobe forwards that forwards that into this green part that's sort of wrapped there under the yellow and almost to that little pink looking thing. And that is your hippocampus, which is the part that sends your body um, the actions it's supposed to take. So if the occipital lobe said, mmm, french fries, I like them, it's going to send a signal and the hippocampus is going to say, okay, arm, okay, fingers, let's reach out and let's take a french fry, all right, let's dip it in ketchup or sauce or whatever you want to do, and we're going to put it in the mouth, and the mouth's going to enjoy it. And last but not least comes the amygdala, that little pink part there. It sits right down here, the base of your brain, right here at the top of your neck, and the amygdala's like, okay, I'll go with that. Uh, because I'm going to tell you in a second what the amygdala is there for. But the amygdala agrees and says, okay, that's a good idea. Let's have some french fries. What happens when there is a threat, when there is a stimulus, and we kick in for that fight or flight activity that was part of our, 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 our smallest part of our brain? The signal comes into the eye, and it hits the thalamus, but the thalamus is overexcited and overstimulated and says, oh, I'm kicking this down to the amygdala because he's good at quick action. And you see that little dotted line that kind of goes there and boom, kicks it right down to the amygdala. And the amygdala, he's the little brother, right? And he said, okay, occipital lobe not getting that. Hippocampus is not getting it. It's up to me. And the amygdala, while he thinks very fast, can only tell you to do so many things. He can tell you to fight. He can tell you it's time for flight. Or if he's confused, he'll tell you to freeze. That's it. Very highly responsive, but very emotional. Whoa, get out of here, I'm scared. Ooh, stand up and fight, because that makes me mad. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to stand right here. Y'all see much of that going on in our world today? We are so overstimulated that our poor amygdalas are getting jacked up all the time. Sometimes, multiple times in a minute, or certainly in a day, an hour, or a day. And we are missing the use of our occipital lobe. We're missing the use of our hippocampus. And it's just going thalamus to amygdala. And it's called the amygdala hijack. And let me tell you how it happens. We are so stimulated primarily by our social media, by uh, the signals from our cell phones, the signals from our computer, the signals from our television or radio or whatever we've got on. Uh, remember, your brain is wired at its base to respond to stimulation and to respond to a threat. It makes you want to go to that, all right? What are the kinds of things many of us find and experience on social media? The most popular websites and the most popular posts are often those that say, oh, you need to see what happens when he did this. And our minds go, oh, I bet that's exciting. And, and here we go. And we go on to it. Um, 
how do the news channels uh, or, or even YouTube and other places, how do they uh, plan their programming? Oh, we got trouble going on in the world. Ukraine's getting attacked. Oil prices going up. Stock market is crashing. Uh, COVID has got a new variant. It, you know, all this stuff happening. Those are the same in electronic form as the saber-toothed tiger appearing around the screen or uh, somebody from another tribe with a spear coming to attack us. Our brain doesn't know the difference in those. And even our cell phone and our apps and all of the other things that we use, what happens when you get a new text message on your phone, especially if you forgot to turn it on silent? What happens? Bing! You know what your brain thinks that bing is? It's calling you. It's like a threat. It's like, oh, I better see what who's texting me. What do they want? What are, I don't want to miss anything. And we pick up the phone. Um, an app. It may be an app for a game. Okay. It may be um, an app that you're using for work. Our apps on our phones and on our, our other things are designed to be addictive. And by that I mean, they are designed to reward us for staying in the app or staying on the on the game. Right? You get a reward. You get a new level. You get a badge. Come on. Even Facebook told me this morning that I'm a top fan of the Christian Baptist Fellowship International. Did I want a badge? They doing that. Why is that? Why are they always saying, oh, man, you can level up? You know, why are they doing that? Every time you get that positive stimulation from an app or a game or a website or a video, you get a little bit of dopamine stimulus in your brain. It's the pleasure center. And your brain says, I like that. I'm going to give me some more. And they pull you in. And that's why today the average time Americans spend on social media is two hours and 27 minutes a day. Some of you are already thinking, well, I think I'm more than that. <laughs> and I'm asking you to confess. That's why this is an average. Some people are more and some people are less. Some people say, I don't, no, I don't get on social media. I don't know. But this doesn't include time for text message or emails or strolling through watching videos on TikTok or YouTube. Okay? Mm. I told you Dr. Sims laid the groundwork here. Be honest for a minute. You don't have to you don't have to answer out loud. How many times a day you think you pick up your phone? Or, how, many, how many of you picked up your phone and looked at it since I've been On average, 50 to 100 times a day for all of us. You know it. You know it. No wonder our brains don't have any time to think. Always, always being stimulated. Always. Fear of missing out is the big driver. If I don't check my message, I might miss something. If I don't take that phone call, I might miss somebody who really needs to talk to me. If I don't read that email and respond, I, you know, something might happen. And pastors, y'all know you get driven by this. People want you, need you, whatever. But we all do. Mm. And here is the result. Science underst is understanding this. Here is the result of all of that stimulation constantly, constantly coming into our brains. They call it cognitive offloading. 
Now, anything cognitive means it has to do with your brain, right? With your thought process. And so here's what our brains do because they're getting so much stimulation, so much social media, so many videos, so many text messages, so many emails, on and on and on, listening to so many songs, on and on and on. The, you can only hold so much in your brain at one time. And so your brain begins to offload some other things that it's equipped for. Remember that picture we had a minute ago? Your, your brain is equipped for stuff to come in and then go on through and go to the purple part of the brain and then go to the end. Your brain is equipped for all of that, but these signals want to, want to jack into that amygdala and it's so small and it only holds so much. And so our brain begins to offload some other things and we are developing as a society a lack of memory formation we create m many fewer memories these days and we remember many fewer facts and events and occurrences why because we're getting it all from here and so as a society, we have fewer memories. We have fewer memories in our family, memory, fewer memories in our church, fewer memories everywhere. We are seeing a lack of deep learning, taking things in and letting it go into your brain and letting it get into your life and using it because we have become a society that crams for our information. I don't need to know it. I'll go Google it. We leave in deep learning behind. We are losing our intellectual confidence. Why? Wow, we've got influencers to tell us what to think. My favorite TikToker, my favorite IG, Instagram, YouTube. Your favorite cable news channel or whatever you watch, they'll tell me what to think. Maybe we come in and say, I, I don't have to understand the Bible. I don't have to think about these things. My pastor will tell me what to think. That's dangerous. We've got the best. Some of y'all are the best pastors I know, and some of you got the best pastors I know. Are you supposed to listen to them and never think about what they're telling you? I don't think so. But we're losing our intellectual ability and our confidence. Sister Audrey, Minister Audrey, I love when you said this today. We are losing our ability uh, for originality and creativity. We don't have to think of something new to do because somebody else out there has already done it and we'll just copy theirs. We're losing the deep ability. It's wonderful creativity that, that is part of our gifts. And just look at some of your young people. Look at some of your young adults. And that's all. And finally, we are losing our people skills. We're losing the ability to talk to each other, to communicate with each other, to care for each other. Why? Why are we losing our people skills? <laughs> it, it is. You ever go in a restaurant or y'all look while you're there? You go in a restaurant and you see people sitting at a table. What are everybody doing? That's right. That's right. Do it. You do it. I do it. That, we had to be on purpose to make a rule in our family when everybody comes for family dinner. Mm -mm, no cell phones. Uh -uh, put them down. My grandchildren think they're about to die five minutes without their cell phone. We are losing our sense of connection with each other and with God because we must be stimulated all the time. And again, I'm not asking for any confessions and I'm not, 
I start saying I'm not preaching. Maybe I am. But just think for a moment of your worship. When was the last time as a congregation you paused for a minute, one solid minute of silence? Think or pray. Most of the time we want to keep it moving, right? I came up as a, a, a worship leader, right? And we've got some great worship leaders in this fellowship. And the thing I was told was, don't ever let there be any lull. Don't let there be any silence. Be sure something is always happening. We're singing. We're clapping. Bishop Deans is dancing. Uh, we're speaking. We're praying. We're reading the scripture. The preacher is sharing. But the, the worst thing you could do, I was told, was let it drop and have nothing happening. I'm not sure that's the worst thing. We're losing our sense of connection with each other and with God. I want to talk about, and then I'm going to close with another experience. I want to go a little bit longer. What? It's my time. How are we doing? Ooh, better get moving. I want to talk about how your heart and your brain are connected and how especially the heart can help to renew the brain and vice versa. Now, remember our Proverbs 23, 7, our main, uh, our main scripture for today, as a person thinks and that flows to their heart, that's the way they are. So there's a connection between what we think and what we feel. It's hard to bring connection. I want to tell you something about your heart, okay? These statistics you're seeing are about your heart. Your heart has 40,000 neurons in it. You know what a neuron is? Neurons are the cells and, and, and the organisms in our body that send communication, Right? And so you, your brain is the king. It's got millions of neurons, all right? And they're firing all the time, and they're sending signals. But your heart ain't no slacker. 40,000 neurons. And there are doctors who call your heart your second brain. Because the heart, get this, can learn, it can remember, and it can make decisions. And whenever we've been told you must learn to lead with the heart, to do that. Because your heart is smart. It is equipped, literally, to think. Who was described as a man after God's own heart? In scripture? King David. Right? Now, he wasn't perfect. We know that. But his heart was attuned to the heart of God. And that heart helps to inform the brain and the body. They are connected. Wow. Now, in the full workshop that I'm going to do, and maybe that's going to be at a future conference and uh, in the book I'm going to write, um, We'll go into more depth with this, but I just want you to grasp that for a minute. Your heart does much more than just beat and pump blood. Your heart, it literally does feel. It's why we talk about how we feel things in our heart. It's smart. It learns. It remembers. You know somebody you had a bad experience with years ago, and all they got to do is walk in the room? What does your heart do? Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and hey, turn that around. Love. Like, try to remember when y'all were young and you first started falling in love. You just, you know, you saw somebody that, and what do we say? Oh, they come in. It makes my heart beat faster. <laughs> You don't think your heart is smart? It is. And we should listen to it more often. Okay? Now, before I close out, because we're going to do a little bit deeper exercise, anybody 
want to make a comment, ask a question. I, I may not be able to hear you clearly, but uh, Bishop Dixon or Lorenzo or somebody could relay that. Anybody want to react to what we've heard so far? I probably should have stopped earlier with that. Anybody want, got anything they'd like to say or just, just ask or comment on before I close out? Because I'm going to ask you to clear your mind in a minute. I have a question. Can we do a, a meditation music? Can we meditate? Can we put some music with it? Somebody's going to have to help repeat that. I kind of heard it. What was the question? Can you meditate Come closer. Music? Yeah. Absolutely. I started to include a music meditation today. Uh, absolutely, you can. I, I would encourage you at the beginning not to do that until you've learned to breathe a few times and, and do what I'm about to do. And you want to be careful of the music you meditate with. Um, in meditation, we, 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 by the way, I've been trained to be a certified meditation facilitator, and that's where I learned a lot of this. Um, we learn first to use music that has no words. Right? It just just the music plays or it's not even associated with words why why would you start until you're better experienced why would you start with music that has no words because those words are another form of stimulation going into your brain you're going to start thinking about the words right? and there's a time and place for that but what i'm trying to help us understand is we got to break a few of the modern habits we've developed yes, we throw on the radio we put in the you know uh, on the ipod or we listen on our phone and we put the headphones in and all of a sudden we're listening to whatever okay and if you're listening to a good song that can be a good a, a good exercise but it is still with the beat with the music with the words it is still going in 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 into your brain and what i'm interested in first is us learning to give our brain a little bit of a break, give it a little more time yeah. and space. Okay, so great question. Definitely, yes, there is a place to meditate, but I'm going to encourage us all to start with these kind of baby steps, just kind of waiting. Other question, comment? Yes, sir, I have a question. Uh, yes, sir. You spoke, of, you spoke earlier about our brains being so clogged up with uh, with, I guess, just daily living and, and some of the habits that we have. Well, I'll be the first to say that uh, my memory is not quite what it used to be. Uh, and so, and, and even, in, even, in, even, even in scripture, uh, uh, referring back to, you know, memory, remembering certain scriptures and different things of that nature, uh, what can we do to improve that or to reverse that, that cycle? Uh, to where mm -hmm. our mind is more uh, uh, accepted of the word. Abs absolutely. The track I'm trying to lead you on, remember we're talking about day restoring. Mm -hmm. We're restoring. You can restore. Okay, y'all excuse me one second. Thank you. Thank you, Wally. Helper in my office today. Um, we're talking about restoring. And yes, one of it now, okay, one of the reasons that we remember less than we used to is all of this overstimulation. Now, we also know there's just getting older and our brains are not as uh, uh, elastic. The literal term is neuroelastic neuroelasticity. Your, your brain is flexible and young kids are real flexible. You know, they, they, can, they remember stuff, they remember songs, they remember all this stuff. And as we get older, we're less flexible. But one of the things meditation does is it begins to restore the neuroelasticity of your brain. And you can, when you consistently meditate, when you consistently use these practices, you can clear out that space, renew that brain, and find yourself able to recall better okay. Okay. it's a great question it's a healing process Thank you. so we'll learn again i want to present more advanced things but trust me when i say start with where we are right here if you'll just take that short little exercise we did at the beginning and then if you'll also take what i'm about to lead you in you will you will gain a lot uh you will gain a lot from this and you will restore some of that function and uh, 
Yeah, good question. What else do we have? This is why I wish I was with you all and I could just talk about this with you at the table and in the fellowship and, you know, but we're doing what we can. Okay, now, you need to kind of shift again. You may even want to stand up for a second and I'm going to do that just to stretch my legs out and get a little blood flow back in there. All right, shake my hands, shake my arms, you know, because I know we've been sitting and we're almost done and we're going to have the Academy presentation and uh, Ambassador Linden's going to have a chance to uh, talk about that and then she's got a great presentation this afternoon. Uh, come on back uh, to your seat and get as comfortable as you can. And get as comfortable as you can after you finish stretching uh, and come back. And I'm going to take you a little deeper now. And again, I should trust me. Be sure you put everything down. Phone's not on beep. You know, nobody's going to text you. You're not going to miss anything in the next 10 minutes, I promise you. Now close your eyes and get comfortable as you can in your chair. And I want you to just settle into this moment. You're breathing in and out through your nose. Feel the rhythm of that breath. And I want you to slow your breath down a bit. Breathe a little slower in and out. Now again, allow the edges of your eyes to soften. Let your eyes be relaxed. Your jaw slightly open. Let your shoulders drop. You've heard a lot today and your thoughts are going to come and go. You brought a lot of things with you and there are thoughts swirling around. And if you start thinking about this or, or that, just come back to your breath. And just silently repeating in your mind, in, on the in breath. And out, on the out breath. And just let those thoughts pass by. Now slow your breath down even a little more. Slowly in, slowly out. Check your eyes, let them relax. Your jaw slightly open. Drop your shoulders. The rhythm of your breath helps you to release and let go attention. Now I want you to bring your awareness all the way down into your midsection, down here just at the bottom of your ribs. Just think about dropping down there. And you can feel your ribs as you breathe. They go out when you breathe in. And those ribs contract back in when you breathe out. Just stay with that feeling for a minute. You breathe in and the ribs go out. And you breathe out and your ribs go back down. You're just thinking in on the in breath and out on the out breath.
Your thoughts come and they go. Now, bring your attention to your heart. If your breath were coming in and out of your heart, slowing your breath down. Feeling at ease. Notice if your body needs to shift, getting comfortable. Focusing on that area of your heart. Your breath is slow and steady. Now with your heart, with your spirit, to these familiar words and see if there's anything new for you to hear today. Not just with your ears, not just with your mind, but with your heart. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down. in the soft green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley Even the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. For you are with me. You are with me. You prepare the table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life.
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. And just dwell in that place where you are right now for just another moment. Breathing. Dwelling. And now, as you slowly bring your attention back to the sound of my voice, begin focusing a little bit more on your inhalations as you breathe in. Let that breath coming in begin to bring you more awake. Your attention is still in the area of your heart. And you are listening for any last bits of guidance, anything that you you want to remember and take with you. Now, to to give yourself three longer, slower breaths in and out. And again, deeper breath in and out. Again, in and out. Now bring your attention down to your feet and you begin rotating your ankles, point and flex your feet. Now coming up through your legs to your hips, you can move, come up into your chest, Come across your shoulders, down your arms, opening and closing your hands. You're moving now. Now travel up into your throat. Your jaw is still open. The edges of your eyes are still soft as the feeling now comes up into that space behind your eyes. They're still relaxed. You are feeling alert and refreshed. And on your next breath, when you breathe out, let your eyes slowly open. You're not focusing on anything too quickly. There's a smile on your face for the feeling of gratitude. I want you to take time to reflect. Don't start talking just yet. Here's what I suggest. Begin to write. Just write for at least a minute or so here. Just begin to write. Take up your pen and paper. Begin to write and consider What do I feel or know now that I didn't before? Something you felt, something that came to you while you heard those words from the song. And in a moment, I'll ask us to think of one positive step you can take from this time. Let's just spend a moment to reflect.
I hope maybe you were able to write or think something. It, in learning to do this exercise, you would sit for about three to five minutes and just write. There's something powerful about the experience and then letting it come out through your fingers onto a piece of paper, through the pen. We're not going to take very long. We're about to wrap this up. Does, does anybody have something? You, would you like to read what you wrote or share something felt? You may be sharing and I can't hear it. Please feel free. Calmness, peace. Anything else from the experience? Dr. Ferris, can you hear me? I can. I know this might sound strange, but uh, <laughs> when I was thinking, I was going back to that verse, that Proverbs 23 and 7, and I was thinking yeah. about uh, what you said for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And I was thinking about the Hebrew going back, and that's translated as that part is inwardly, which is uh, binapso. And I was thinking yeah. about how, you know, that's a preposition, and how, you know, one part of it is in the noun feminine singular construct, and how the second part is talking about me. And then when I go yeah. to that spirit can, how it switches to the third person masculine singular yeah. form which means soul, which means life, mm. how we can mm. get back, you know, when we, when we meditate, and we, we not only yeah. getting back to us, but we also must get back as Christian to that Holy, to that inner spirit, that Holy Spirit, yes. and how, yes. I, how I need to slow down sometimes, and, and mm. get back to that, not only with all the words, get back to listening and being able to hear that Holy Spirit, and also connecting that, you know, to my spirit, man, making sure that both of them are being connected. Yep. I know that sounds strange, but that's what No, no, no. And nothing, nothing crazy about it. See, this, when we stop and slow down, these kind of things begin to emerge. And I, I didn't include it today. I don't have time. This is the Elijah experience in the cave, right? He was worn out. He was weary. God gave him time to rest. And then God said, come and stand in before me. And there was wind. There was a hurricane. There was a storm. There was lightning. There was fire. There was an earthquake. None of that had God in it. And then came a still, small voice. And that's where God was. And this kind of meditation can help lead us to a place to hear the still, small voice, the quiet that you just described. It's a rarity in our world. Dr. Fairness. Amen. Yes. I've come to, um, a lot of times I meditate with music too, sometimes just instrumental, but I can't hear that voice with that music. Yeah. So the quiet is what we need. Yeah, quietness. Did, did anybody feel like you'd missed the quiet when you when you're in the midst of it today? Like I wrote on first, yeah, first thing I wrote on my paper, I have not felt this calm in a while. Yeah. Calm, quiet, still. I've, and when I had to start bringing y'all back, I was like, no, I want to stay a little more. Because <laughs> I don't. Oh. It resonated with me. God is my shepherd. And God is your shepherd. I was beginning to worry about all of you in the room there because I couldn't be with you. I was beginning to worry. Are they getting this? Is, do they think this is stupid? Or what? Well, you know what? And all of a sudden, God said, I'm your shepherd, and I'm their shepherd too. Wow, man. You can quit worrying. You see what comes out when we take time? This discipline. 
again, you, you may have written these down. I'm going to make this slide deck available. And um, uh, Pastor Dixon, Bishop Dixon, I, I don't know if uh, there's any way to print any of this, but I'll be sure you've got it. Uh, or I'll be I'll be happy to send this PowerPoint uh, to anybody that wants it after the conference. More is coming. But the short exercise I gave you at the beginning, and then this was a deeper exercise. You see how it was the same, but then we went a little further. Yeah. And what I want to be able to offer to us and as the CBF eventually is a way that you can learn. I don't know if this will be one of our courses or whatever, a time that any are willing could come and you begin to learn these practices so that you can begin to incorporate them. You've all got enough to start with today. Before you leave, meditate again. Be like Isaac. Go out to meditate in the eventide tonight. All right. You and, and take this home with you and share it if you'd like. Begin to just breathe. Begin, begin to go down into that silence. Take a simple passage of scripture. You notice I read it just a phrase at a time and give your spirit time to think about it. That's what meditating is. Time to chew on it. Let it remember rest and digest. Rest and digest. That's what we're trying to do give you this last quote. I just read this this morning in my meditation. Sister Catherine Doherty, she was Catholic. She started the Madonna House in Canada, a place where people could come and be quiet. And she says, true silence is a key to the immense and flaming heart of God. True silence is a key to the immense heart of God, that love that's so much bigger than we can imagine, the flaming heart of God that burns with passion that we so need. But like Elijah learned, we don't find it in the fire. We don't find it in the earthquake. We don't find it in all of the busyness and the activity. We find it in true silence. Amen? Amen. And <laughs> uh, Bishop Dixon, Bishop Toller, I know we have a, um, uh, a uh, what am I trying to say, a, a, a presentation from the academy, but, uh, and it's going to be good, and it's going to move quick. It's going to be a much bigger, uh, 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 much <laughs> more lively, uh, I would say. But can we take about a, a short break, and do, should we go ahead and do the academy now, or uh, are you ready to go to the lunch break right now? Uh, Dr. Ferris, uh, tomorrow will be the day for um, all of the moving forward stuff okay so it'll be so tomorrow. we'll do that in the morning yes yes okay that's great and that's I'll great send you another invitation so that absolutely. you can um you can get that absolutely fantastic fantastic well great well i know y'all are going to be ready for the lunch break is there anything else that you would like to say or ask is there any other way i can be helpful to you before we Dismiss for the lunch break. Anybody got anything for Dr. Fairless? Any other questions or comments or anything? Um, we're in good time here. Um, so, anybody? I would like. I would, <laughs> I would like to know if you uh, suggest anywhere.